we have several important jobs uh, vacant in this country, including Director of National Security, National Security Advisor. Is that a threat to our security? <laughs> I think it really says something uh, about where we are, uh, what this point in our history uh, looks like. When we find that there are not enough people in the country that are willing uh, to serve in the White House and, and qualified to serve in the White House, uh, who all sides of the government uh, feel comfortable working with and who they can back, uh, we are in a time that is increasingly fractured. And I think that's a product of the fact that, look, if, if you look around at the world right now, when you look at news, when you look at news coverage, when you look at every controversy that we see, um, something has changed. Uh, and that is that it has become increasingly popular for your feelings to matter more than the facts. And I think that's toxic to a democracy because if there's one thing that we have to have uh, to be able to have this discussion, to be able to learn to live with people that we disagree with, uh, we can't have a conversation about what we should do. We can't have a conversation about uh, where we are going if we can't agree on where we are, if we can't agree on what is happening, facts have to matter more than feelings. You've said your greatest fear uh, over what you did was that things would not change. Have things changed? Would you do it again today knowing what you know now? Uh, this is a significant portion of the, the final chapter uh, of my book. Um, Things have changed, and I would do it again. If I changed anything, uh, I would hope that I could have come forward sooner. Uh, it took me so long just to understand what was happening, uh, and it took so long uh, to realize that nobody else uh, was going to fix this. Um, <laughs> believe me when I say um, I did not want to light a match and, and burn my life to the ground. No one does. Um, nobody really wants to be a, a whistleblower. But the results of that uh, have been staggering. I thought this was going to be a two-day story. I thought everybody was going to forget about this uh, a week after um, the journalists ran the first stories in 2013. But here we are in 2019, and we're still talking about it. In fact, uh, data security, surveillance, the Internet, uh, manipulation and influence uh, that's provided or produced, rather, by uh, corporate or governmental control of uh, this permanent record of all of our private lives that's being created every day by the devices that we have. Um, before 2013, if you said there's a system that's watching everything you do, the government is collecting records of every phone call in the United States, uh, even for those people who are not suspected of any crime, it was a conspiracy. Yes, there were some people who believed it was happening. Yes, there were academics who could say this was technically possible. Yes, there were technologists who could, could, went, uh, this is something that could be done. Um, but what we didn't have it, is we, the world of 2013, we suspected, some suspected that this was happening. The world after 2013, we know that it's happening. And this is the critical importance of journalism, particularly in this moment that we have today. The distance between speculation and fact is every in a democracy because that's what lets us, as we did post-2013, change our laws. Now, the very first program that was revealed in newspapers uh, has since been terminated. Barack Obama, who criticized me so strongly in June of 2013, by January of 2014 was proposing that this program be ended. Eventually it was ended under the USA Freedom Act. Uh, the uh, NSA argued that mass surveillance was legal, bulk collection as they, they call it. Um, they said 15 different judges authorized this. What they didn't tell us was that those 15 judges all belonged to the rubber stamp FISA court, uh, that over 33 years had been asked uh, 33,900 times by the government to approve surveillance requests and only said no in 33 years 11 times. Now, this was a court that was never designed to interpret the Constitution, right? It was never designed to create uh, novel powers for the intelligence community. It was just designed to stamp basic routine warrants. Um, 
Now we know what has changed. The very first open court outside of these secret rubber stamp courts that got uh, this case in front of them, uh, it was Judge Leon uh, in a federal court um, and then a court of appeals, uh, said that the NSA's mass surveillance activities were violating even the very loose standards of the Patriot Act. They broke the law. He further said these programs are likely unconstitutional. Uh, and this would not have happened uh, if we couldn't say this is real, this is actually happening. And I, I just want to make clear, um, that's not me saying that. That's not speculation. Uh, that was the determination of the Supreme Court just a few months before I came forward. Uh, in a famous case, Amnesty versus Clapper, uh, I, I believe it was in February of 2013 or, or December of 2012, um, all the way to the Supreme Court, these surveillance authorities were being challenged. Uh, the plaintiff said the government has a mass surveillance program. It has impacted uh, this human rights organization. They have been spied on in secret by the government. The government said that may be, but if it's happening, we will neither conform confirm nor deny that it's happening. Uh, it is a state secret. And because you can't prove it, the court should be forbidden uh, from ruling on the constitutionality of this program. And sadly, the Supreme Court of the United States agreed. They said this program could be unconstitutional, but if you cannot prove it exists, we cannot evaluate it. That's what 2013 changed. On the legal side, um, we have now had the GDPR, we have had the first European regulations uh, that are trying to um, limit the amount of data that can be collected secretly and used against populations broadly. Uh, and we have also seen the basic structure of the Internet itself change in response to this understanding that, that uh, the network path that all of our communications cross, when you request a website, when you send a text message, when you read an email, uh, for so long, those communications have been electronically naked or unencrypted. Before 2013, more than half the world's internet communications were unencrypted. Now, far more than half are measured by uh, just web traffic from one of the world's leading browsers, uh, the Google Chrome browser. Uh, some figures show it at more than 80%. Um, the entire world has changed. Uh, in the last few years. It hasn't gone far enough. The problems still exist. Uh, and in some ways, they've gotten worse. But we have made progress that would not have been possible if we didn't know what was going on. Related question, what today can the government do uh, to your phone and your laptop, the phone and laptop of any American? Um, what's the extent of the government's reach if they're determined to reach into your life? <laughs> Uh, we could talk about this question for hours, <laughs> Brian, but we don't have time, so I'll, I'll try to summarize. Um, hacking uh, has increasingly become uh, what governments consider a legitimate investigative tool. They use the same methods and techniques as criminal hackers. And what this means is they will try to remotely take over your device. Once they do this, um, by detecting a vulnerability in, in the software that your uh, device runs, such as Apple's iOS or Microsoft Windows, they can craft a special kind of attack code called an exploit. They then launch this exploit at the vulnerability on your device, which allows them to take total control of that device. Anything you can do on that device, uh, the attacker, in this case the government, can do. They can read your email. They can collect every document. They can look at your contact book. They can turn the location services on. They can see anything that is on that phone instantly and send it back home to the mothership. They can do the same with laptops. The other prong that we forget so frequently is that in many cases, they don't need to hack our devices. They can simply ask Google for a copy of our email box because Google saves a copy of that. Everything that you ever typed into that search box, Google has a copy of. Every private message that you've sent on Facebook, every link that you've clicked, everything that you've liked, they keep a permanent record of. Uh, and all of these things are available not just to these companies, but to our governments as they are increasingly deputized as uh, sort of miniature arms of government. What about enabling your microphone camera? 
If you can do it, they can do it. Uh, it is trivial uh, to remotely turn on your microphone or to, to activate your camera so long as you have systems level access. If you had hacked someone's device remotely, anything they can do, you can do. Uh, they can look up your nose, right? They can record what's in the room. The screen may be off as it's sitting on your desk, uh, but the device is talking all of the time. The question we have to ask is who is it talking to? Even if your phone is not hacked, right now, you look at it, it's just sitting there on the charger. Uh, it is talking tens or hundreds or thousands of times a minute to any number of different companies uh, who have apps installed on your phone. Uh, it looks like it's off, it looks like it's just sitting there, but it is constantly chattering. And unfortunately, like pollution, uh, we have not created the tools that are necessary for ordinary people to be able to see this activity. And it is the invisibility of it that makes it so popular and common uh, and attractive for these companies. Because if you do not realize they're collecting this data from you, this very private and personal data, um, there's no way you're going to object to it.